Section three of Bartleby the Scrivener, a story of Wall Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bartleby the Scrivener, a story of Wall Street by Herman Melville. Section three. For the first time in my life, a feeling of overpowering, stinging melancholy seized me. Before I had never experienced aught but a not unpleasing sadness. The bond of a common humanity now drew me irresistibly to gloom. A fraternal melancholy. For both I and Bartleby were sons of Adam. I remembered the bright silks and sparkling faces I had seen that day, in gala trim, swan-like sailing down the Mississippi of Broadway, and I contrasted them with the pallid copyist and thought to myself, Ah, happiness courts the light, so we deem the world is gay. But misery hides aloof, so we deem that misery there is none. These sad fancyings, shimmerous doubtless of a sick and silly brain, led on to other and more special thoughts concerning the eccentricities of Bartleby. Presentiments of strange discoveries hovered round me. The scrivener's pale form appeared to me laid out among uncaring strangers in its shivering winding sheet. Suddenly I was attracted by Bartleby's closed desk, the key in open sight left in the lock. I mean no mischief, seek the gratification of no heartless curiosity, thought I. Besides, the desk is mine, and its contents too, so I will make bold to look within. Everything was methodically arranged, the papers smoothly placed. The pigeonholes were deep, and removing the files of documents, I groped into their recesses. Presently I felt something there and dragged it out. It was an old bandana handkerchief, heavy and knotted. I opened it and saw it was a savings bank. I now recalled all the quiet mysteries which I had noted in the man. I remembered that he never spoke but to answer, that though at intervals he had considerable time to himself, yet I had never seen him reading. No, not even a newspaper. That for long periods he would stand looking out at his pale window behind the screen upon the dead brick wall. I was quite sure he never visited any refectory or eating house. While his pale face clearly indicated that he never drank beer like turkey, or tea and coffee even, like other men. That he never went anywhere in particular that I could learn. Never went out for a walk, unless indeed that was the case at present. That he had declined telling who he was, or whence he came, or whether he had any relatives in the world, that though so thin and pale he never complained of ill health. And more than all, I remembered a certain unconscious air of pallid, how shall I call it, of pallid haughtiness, say, or rather an austere reserve about him, which had positively awed me into my tame compliance with his eccentricities, when I had feared to ask him to do the slightest incidental thing for me. Even though I might know, from his long continued motionlessness, that behind his screen he must be standing in one of those dead wall reveries of his. Revolving all these things, and coupling them with the recently discovered fact that he made my office his constant abiding place and home, and not forgetful of his morbid moodiness, revolving all these things, a prudential feeling began to steal over me. My first emotions had been those of pure melancholy and sincerest pity. But just in proportion as the forlornness of Bartleby grew and grew to my imagination, did that same melancholy merge into fear, that pity into repulsion. So true it is, and so terrible too, that up to a certain point, the thought or sight of misery enlists our best affections. But in certain special cases, beyond that point, it does not. They err who would assert that invariably this is owing to the inherent selfishness of the human heart. It rather proceeds from a certain hopelessness of remedying excessive and organic ill. To a sensitive being, pity is not seldom pain, and when at last it is perceived that such pity cannot lead to effectual succor, common sense bids the soul rid of it. What I saw that morning persuaded me that the scrivener was the victim of innate and incurable disorder. I might give alms to his body, but his body did not pain him. It was his soul that suffered, and his soul I could not reach. I did not accomplish the purpose of going to Trinity Church that morning. Somehow the things I had seen disqualified me for the time from church going. I walked homeward, thinking what I would do with Bartleby. 
Finally, I resolved upon this. I would put certain calm questions to him the next morning, touching his history, etc., and if he declined to answer them openly and unreservedly, and I supposed he would prefer not, then to give him a twenty-dollar bill over and above whatever I might owe him, and tell him his services were no longer required, but that if in any other way I could assist him, I would be happy to do so, especially if he desired to return to his native place, wherever that might be, I would willingly help to defray the expenses. Moreover, if, after reaching home, he found himself at any time in want of aid, a letter from him would be sure of a reply. The next morning came. Bartleby, said I, gently calling to him behind his screen. No reply. Bartleby, said I, in a still gentler tone. Come here. I am not going to ask you to do anything you would prefer not to do. I simply wish to speak to you. Upon this he noiselessly slid into view. Will you tell me, Bartleby, where you were born? I would prefer not to. Will you tell me anything about yourself? I would prefer not to. But what reasonable objection can you have to speak to me? I feel friendly towards you. He did not look at me while I spoke, but kept his glance fixed upon my bust of Cicero, which, as I then sat, was directly behind me, some six inches above my head. What is your answer, Bartleby? said I, after waiting a considerable time for a reply, during which his countenance remained immovable only there was the faintest conceivable tremor of the white, attenuated mouth. At present I prefer to give no answer, he said, and retired into his hermitage. It was rather weak in me, I confess, but his manner on this occasion nettled me. Not only did there seem to lurk in it a certain calm disdain, but his perverseness seemed ungrateful, considering the undeniable good usage and indulgence he had received from me. Again I sat ruminating what I should do. Mortified as I was at his behavior, and resolved as I had been to dismiss him when I entered my offices, nevertheless I strangely felt something superstitious knocking at my heart, and forbidding me to carry out my purpose, and denouncing me for a villain if I dared to breathe one bitter word against this forlornest of mankind. At last, familiarly drawing my chair behind his screen, I sat down and said, Bartleby, Never mind, then, about revealing your history, but let me entreat you, as a friend, to comply as far as may be with the usages of this office. Say now you will help to examine papers to-morrow or next day. In short, say now that in a day or two you will begin to be a little reasonable. Say so, Bartleby. At present I would prefer not to be a little reasonable, was his mildly cadaverous reply. Just then the folding doors opened and nippers approached. He seemed suffering from an unusually bad night's rest, induced by severer indigestion than common. He overheard those final words of Bartleby. "'Prefer not, eh?' gritted Nippers. "'I'd prefer him if I were you, sir,' addressing me. "'I'd prefer him. I'd give him preferences, the stubborn mule. What is it, sir, pray, that he prefers not to do now?' Bartleby moved not a limb. "'Mr. Nippers,' said I, "'I'd prefer that you would withdraw for the present.' Somehow of late I had got into the way of involuntarily using this word prefer upon all sorts of not exactly suitable occasions, and I trembled to think that my contact with the Scrivener had already and seriously affected me in a mental way. And what further and deeper aberration might it not yet produce? This apprehension had not been without efficacy in determining me to my summary means. As Nippers, looking very sour and sulky, was departing, Turkey blandly and deferentially approached. "'With submission, sir,' said he, "'yesterday I was thinking about Bartleby here, "'and I think that if he would but prefer "'to take a quart of good ale every day, "'it would do much towards mending him "'and enabling him to assist in examining his papers.' "'So you have got the word, too,' said I, slightly excited. "'With submission, what word, sir?' asked Turkey, "'respectfully crowding himself into the contracted space behind the screen, "'and by so doing making me jostle the Scrivener. "'What word, sir?' I would prefer to be left alone here, said Bartleby, as if offended at being mobbed in his privacy. That's the word, Turkey, said I, that's it. Oh, prefer, oh yes, queer word, I never use it myself. But, sir, as I was saying, if he would but prefer... Turkey, I interrupted, you will please withdraw. 
Oh, certainly, sir, if you prefer that I should. As he opened the folding door to retire, Nippers at his desk caught a glimpse of me and asked whether I would prefer to have a certain paper copied on blue paper or white. He did not in the least roguishly accent the word prefer. It was plain that it involuntarily rolled from his tongue. I thought to myself, surely I must get rid of a demented man who already has in some degree turned the tongues, if not the heads, of myself and clerks. But I thought it prudent not to break the dismission at once. The next day I noticed that Bartleby did nothing but stand at his window in his dead wall reverie. Upon asking him why he did not write, he said that he had decided upon doing no more writing. "'Why? How now? What next?' exclaimed I. "'Do no more writing?' "'No more.' "'And what is the reason?' "'Do you not see the reason for yourself?' he indifferently replied. I looked steadfastly at him and perceived that his eyes looked dull and glazed. Instantly it occurred to me that his unexampled diligence in copying by his dim window for the first few weeks of his stay with me might have temporarily impaired his vision. I was touched. I said something in condolence with him. I hinted that, of course, he did wisely in abstaining from writing for a while, and urged him to embrace that opportunity of taking wholesome exercise in the open air. This, however, he did not do. A few days after this, my other clerks being absent, and being in a great hurry to dispatch certain letters by the mail, I thought that, having nothing else earthly to do, Bartleby would surely be less inflexible than usual, and carry these letters to the post office. But he blankly declined. So much to my inconvenience, I went myself. Still added days went by. Whether Bartleby's eyes improved or not, I could not say. To all appearance, I thought they did, but when I asked him if they did, he vouchsafed no answer. At all events, he would do no copying. At last, in reply to my urgings, he informed me that he had permanently given up copying. What? exclaimed I. Suppose your eyes should get entirely well, better than ever before, would you not copy then? I have given up copying, he answered, and slid aside. He remained as ever a fixture in my chamber. Nay, if that were possible, he became still more of a fixture than before. What was to be done? He would do nothing in the office. Why should he stay there? In plain fact, he had now become a millstone to me, not only useless as a necklace, but afflictive to bear. Yet I was sorry for him. I speak less than truth when I say that, on his own account, he occasioned me uneasiness. If he would but have named a single relative or friend, I would instantly have written, and urged their taking the poor fellow away to some convenient retreat. But he seemed alone, absolutely alone in the universe, a bit of wreck in the mid-Atlantic. At length, necessities connected with my business tyrannized over all other considerations. Decently as I could, I told Bartleby that in six days' time he must unconditionally leave the office. I warned him to take measures in the interval for procuring some other abode. I offered to assist him in this endeavor, if he himself would but take the first step towards a removal. "'And when you finally quit me, Bartleby,' added I, "'I shall see that you go not away entirely unprovided. Six days from this hour, remember.' At the expiration of that period, I peeped behind the screen, and lo, Bartleby was there. I buttoned up my coat, balanced myself, advanced slowly towards him, touched his shoulder, and said, "'The time has come. You must quit this place. I'm sorry for you. Here is money, but you must go.' "'I would prefer not,' he replied, with his back still towards me. "'You must.' He remained silent. Now I had an unbounded confidence in this man's common honesty. He had frequently restored to me sixpences and shillings carelessly dropped upon the floor, for I am apt to be very reckless in such shirt-button affairs. The proceeding then which followed will not be deemed extraordinary. Bartleby, said I, I owe you twelve dollars on account. Here are thirty-two. The odd twenty are yours. Will you take it? And I handed the bills towards him. But he made no motion. I will leave them here then, putting them under a weight on the table. Then, taking my hat and cane and going to the door, I tranquilly turned and added, after you have removed your things from these offices, Bartleby, you will of course lock the door, since everyone is now gone for the day but you, 
and if you please, slip your key underneath the mat, so that I may have it in the morning. I shall not see you again, so good-bye to you. If hereafter in your new place of abode I can be of any service to you, do not fail to advise me by letter. Good-bye, Bartleby, and fare you well. But he answered not a word. Like the last column of some ruined temple, he remained standing mute and solitary in the middle of the otherwise deserted room. As I walked home in a pensive mood, my vanity got the better of my pity. I could not but highly plume myself on my masterly management in getting rid of Bartleby. Masterly, I call it, and such it must appear to any dispassionate thinker. The beauty of my procedure seemed to consist in its perfect quietness. There was no vulgar bullying, no bravado of any sort, no choleric hectoring and striding to and fro across the apartment, jerking out vehement commands for Bartleby to bundle himself off with his beggarly traps, nothing of the kind. Without loudly bidding Bartleby depart, as an inferior genius might have done, I assumed the ground that depart he must, and upon that assumption built all I had to say. The more I thought over my procedure, the more I was charmed with it. Nevertheless, next morning, upon awakening, I had my doubts. I had somehow slept off the fumes of vanity. One of the coolest and wisest hours a man has is just after he awakes in the morning. My procedure seemed as sagacious as ever, but only in theory. How it would prove in practice, there was the rub. It was truly a beautiful thought to have assumed Bartleby's departure, but after all that assumption was simply my own, and none of Bartleby's. The great point was, not whether I had assumed that he would quit me, but whether he would prefer so to do. He was more a man of preferences than assumptions. After breakfast I walked downtown, arguing the probabilities pro and con. One moment I thought it would prove a miserable failure, and Bartleby would be found all alive at my office as usual. The next moment it seemed certain that I should see his chair empty, and so I kept veering about. At the corner of Broadway and Canal Street, I saw quite an excited group of people standing in earnest conversation. "'I'll take odds he doesn't,' said a voice as I passed. "'Doesn't go? Done,' said I. "'Put up your money.' I was instinctively putting my hand in my pocket to produce my own, when I remembered that this was an election day. The words I had overheard bore no reference to Bartleby, but to the success or non-success of some candidate for the mayoralty. In my intent frame of mind, I had, as it were, imagined that all Broadway shared in my excitement, and were debating the same question with me. I passed on, very thankful that the uproar of the street screened my momentary absent-mindedness. As I had intended, I was earlier than usual at my office door. I stood listening for a moment. All was still. He must be gone. I tried the knob. The door was locked. Yes, my procedure had worked to a charm. He indeed must be vanished. Yet a certain melancholy mixed with this. I was almost sorry for my brilliant success. I was fumbling under the doormat for the key, which Bartleby was to have left there for me, when accidentally my knee knocked against a panel, producing a summoning sound, and in response a voice came to me from within. Not yet, I am occupied. It was Bartleby. I was thunderstruck. For an instant I stood like the man who, pipe in mouth, was killed one cloudless afternoon long ago in Virginia by a summer lightning. At his own warm, open window he was killed, and remained leaning out there upon the dreamy afternoon till someone touched him when he fell. Not gone, I murmured at last, but again obeying that wondrous ascendancy which the inscrutable Scrivener had over me, and from which ascendancy for all my chafing I could not completely escape. I slowly went downstairs and out into the street, and while walking round the block, considered what I should next do in this unheard-of perplexity. Turn the man out by an actual thrusting I could not. To drive him away by calling him hard names would not do. Calling in the police was an unpleasant idea, and yet, permit him to enjoy his cadaverous triumph over me, this too I could not think of. What was to be done, or if nothing could be done, was there anything further that I could assume in the matter? Yes, as before, I had prospectively assumed that Bartleby would depart, so now I might retrospectively assume that departed he was. In the legitimate carrying out of this assumption, I might enter my office in a great hurry, and, pretending not to see Bartleby at all, walk straight against him as if he were heir. 
such a proceeding would in a singular degree have the appearance of a home thrust. It was hardly possible that Bartleby could withstand such an application of the doctrine of assumptions. But upon second thoughts, the success of the plan seemed rather dubious. I resolved to argue the matter over with him again. Bartleby, said I, entering the office with a quietly severe expression, I am seriously displeased. I am pained, Bartleby. I had thought better of you. I had imagined you of such a gentlemanly organization that in any delicate dilemma a slight hint would have suffice. In short, an assumption. But it appears I am deceived. Why, I added unaffectedly starting, you have not even touched that money yet, pointing to it just where I had left it the evening previous. He answered nothing. Will you or will you not quit me? I now demanded in a sudden passion, advancing close to him. I would prefer not to quit you, he replied, gently emphasizing the not. What earthly right have you to stay here? Do you pay any rent? Do you pay my taxes? Or is this property yours? He answered nothing. Are you ready to go on and write now? Are your eyes recovered? Could you copy a small paper for me this morning? Or help examine a few lines? Or step round to the post office? In a word, will you do anything at all to give a coloring to your refusal to depart the premises? He silently retired into his hermitage. I was now in such a state of nervous resentment that I thought it but prudent to check myself at present from further demonstrations. Bartleby and I were alone. I remembered the tragedy of the unfortunate Adams and the still more unfortunate Colt in the solitary office of the latter. And how poor Colt, being dreadfully incensed by Adams, and imprudently permitting himself to get wildly excited, was at unawares hurried into his fatal act, an act which certainly no man could possibly deplore more than the actor himself. Often it had occurred to me in my ponderings upon the subject, that had that altercation taken place in the public street, or at a private residence, it would not have terminated as it did. It was the circumstance of being alone in a solitary office, upstairs, of a building entirely unhallowed by humanizing domestic associations, an uncarpeted office, doubtless, of a dusty, haggard sort of appearance. This it must have been, which greatly helped to enhance the irritable desperation of the hapless colt. But when this old atom of resentment rose in me, and tempted me concerning Bartleby, I grappled him and threw him. How? Why, simply by recalling the divine injunction, A new commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another. Yes, this it was that saved me. Aside from higher considerations, charity often operates as a vastly wise and prudent principle, a great safeguard to its possessor. Men have committed murder for jealousy's sake, and anger's sake, and hatred's sake, and selfishness sake, and spiritual pride's sake. But no man that I ever heard of ever committed a diabolical murder for sweet charity's sake. Mere self-interest, then, if no better motive can be enlisted, should, especially with high-tempered men, prompt all beings to charity and philanthropy. At any rate, upon the occasion in question, I strove to drown my exasperated feelings towards the Scrivener by benevolently construing his conduct. Poor fellow, poor fellow, thought I, he don't mean anything, and besides, he has seen hard times, and ought to be indulged. I endeavored also immediately to occupy myself, and at the same time to comfort my despondency. I tried to fancy that in the course of the morning, at such time as might prove agreeable to him, Bartleby, of his own free accord, would emerge from his hermitage, and take up some decided line of march in the direction of the door. But no. Half-past twelve o'clock came. Turkey began to glow in the face, overturn his inkstand, and become generally obstreperous. Nippers abated down into quietude and courtesy. Ginger Nut munched his noon apple, and Bartleby remained standing at his window in one of his profoundest dead-wall reveries. Will it be credited? Ought I to acknowledge it? That afternoon I left the office without saying one further word to him. End of section 3